hello and welcome back and that is right today i want to talk about two ssds from seagate both of which are targeted at nas both of which are in nvme4 both of which are supported by the majority of network attached drawings devices but are very very different in architecture and although the price is different between them it's actually not that much different once you break it down to the price per gigabyte or price per terabyte and a number of you right now at the end of 2021 are wondering which one of these two should you go for because even though their architecture is fantastically different their pros and cons are actually kind of offset against each other and throughout this video you may notice some reasons why the older generation device here, known as the Seagate iWolf 510, is actually better in some ways than their latest release. Both of these are SSDs that are designed for network attached storage, predominantly to be utilized in systems like Synology and QNAP that have either dedicated M2 NVMe slots inside or have PCIe upgrade slots that allow you to add SSDs inside and take advantage of the improved performance, throughput, high IOPS and low latency that SSD has and bolster a large array of slower hard drives. Generally, rather than trying to populate a NAS just with SSDs, which can be incredibly price prohibitive and low durability, it allows you to add just one or two SSDs to improve throughput and performance from within the device, either to more commonly accessed files or to the whole system in general, and kind of offset the overall cost of improving the performance of your NAS without completely replacing all of the hard drives inside. So let's talk a little about these two NVMe SSDs. Now let's talk about the old one first. This one is the Seagate Ironwolf 510. It came out in around March, April 2020. And when it did arrive on the scene, it arrived again in several uh, capacities. It's still available now. It's available in 240 gig, 480 gig, 960 gig, and uh, 1.2, uh, 1.92 terabytes, which I know you're already thinking, why has this got such a ridiculous uh, capacity uh, measurement there? That's because of something known as over provisioning, where the SSD will kind of utilize an area of available space on each of the NAND chips to be utilized in maintaining performance and having a nice little scratch area for the drive to use internally. Hence why some drives have got that sort of slight offset there on capacity but also this took advantage at the time of a great little controller the Fizon E12 although not at that point the most modern controller from Fizon it was still a great NVMe controller there supporting PCIe um, sorry uh, NVMe revision uh, 1.3 it also arrived with support of PCIe Gen 3 times 4 which is pretty much what 95% of NAS these days <clears throat> feature as their M2 NVMe slot, PCIe Gen 3 in one form or another. And also took advantage of 3D TLC NAND and that's Coaxia 64 layer uh, NAND there. So again, pretty good for the time, it has to be said. Um, a durability is what really stood out on this NVMe, uh, ranging from uh, uh, 0 0.9 to 1.0 drive writes per day, meaning that for every terabyte that you wrote to this, you could refresh and replace that data up to, uh, in the case of a terabyte, 900 gigabytes to one terabyte per day throughout its life cycle of five years there. And also this drive arrived with um, not only five years warranty, but three years data recovery services built in. So again, a lovely drive for NAS that is built around the idea of endurance and durability in the heavy rigors of caching. Now, the newer generation drive that arrived in October 2021, this drive arrived with a lot of upgrades in that year, maybe year to year and a half period. For a start, it arrives with the Fizon E16 controller, which again isn't the most modern PCIe uh, NVMe SSD controller they, uh, the company Fizon have made, that E18. But the E16 is still pretty darn good. Why has it got the E16? Because it's a PCIe Gen 4 times 4 SSD, opening up a huge degree of bandwidth with PCIe Gen 3 times 4 allowing up to a potential 4,000 megabytes per second and this a potential 8,000 megabytes per second. Now, no SSDs on the market right now fully saturate that bandwidth, but some of them are getting pretty darn close. Unfortunately, this is not one of them as we'll talk about later on in the video. Uh, this arrives again with 3D TLC NAND and it's coaxia, but it's 96 layer. So it's a better enduring and high performing NAND, something will become 
more apparent as the video continues. It also took advantage of NVMe one, uh, Revision 1 1.3 as well, but its driver rights per day was rated at 0 0.17. I'm sorry, 0 0.7 drive rights per day, which again is less than that 0 0.9 to 0, uh, 1.0 drive rights per day there on that Fire Cuda, I'm uh, sorry, the Iron Wolf 510 there. Sorry, something just went past the back of the camera there. Um, but it's still really high for a modern grade SSD, with the majority of SSDs averaging out about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 drive rights per day in their lifetime. And also, it does arrive with five years warranty and that three years data recovery services included. So between the two of them, there's actually a, quite a lot of disparity there in a, you know, a little under a year and a half release difference between them. It's also worth highlighting that this arrives in 500 gig, one TB and two TB. So it, they got rid of that um, over provisioning uh, storage requirement there. It is built in. Once you look at the coaxial NAND, you can see that it is taken advantage in the case of the 1TB model there. It's got four um, 256 gigabyte NAND chips on board. So over provisioning is there, but it's being done more silently in the background there. Now, between the two of them, the price difference at each tier level, this one arrives notably um, lower it, well, not low, it arrives at a price point that's a bit weird to scale up against one another. Again, I don't know if it's already arrived there on screen, but this arrives at, uh, with reach capacity at $99, $179, and $359 at each of those three tiers. This one, on the other hand, even a year and a half after it's released, the price hasn't changed that much. At $69, $110, um, $200, and $400, for each of those capacities. So again, this one is technically more expensive, which is really weird. And a lot of that money is centered around that endurance difference between them. Now, whether that's because PCIe Gen 4 has become a lot more readily available, and this is kind of the third or fourth PCIe Gen 4 SSD from Seagate, and they've kind of flexed their arms a little bit, whereas at this point, NVMe, although it was still available, wasn't as fleshed out as the PCIe Gen 4 strategy from Seagate, it's weird that their newest, faster SSD is technically lower in price at every capacity tier. Of course, durability is still the name of the game when it comes to the 510, and let's not cut it out just because of that price difference between them. Now, in terms of performance between these two drives, and let's remove those boxes from there and have a closer look at the drives themselves, the performance difference between these two is actually quite substantial. Now, it's worth highlighting once again that the older generation drive, that is a PCIe Gen 3 times 4. And it, again, this one here is a Gen 4 times 4. So even if, you know, we look at that performance maximum, clearly this one is going to be higher. It's taken advantage of that larger available bandwidth and it allows it to reach much higher speeds. And at Gen 4, utilized in a Gen 4 times 4 M2 NVMe slot, it has the potential to hit a maximum 5,000 megabytes per second sequential read and 4,400 megabytes per second sequential write. Now, this IronWolf 510, on the other hand, even for a Gen 3 times 4 SSD, is still pretty darn low with the maximum performance of all of the capacities, I believe that being the 1TB model, achieving 3,150 megabytes per second sequential read and 1,000 megabytes per second sequential write. That's pretty low for this SSD. Now, if you could immediately and very fairly state that I shouldn't use the Gen 4 statistics of this drive to compare these, it's not fair. There's not a lot of Gen 4 NASs out there. Equally, this isn't a Gen 4 SSD and they should be on an even footing. Even in that regard, if you put this SSD inside a Gen 3 times 4 SSD slot, the maximum performance reported by Seagate and verified in our original reviews when we did benchmark and testing on it is 3,400 megabytes per second sequential read and 3,200 megabytes per second sequential write. So again, even in its home turf, the 3 times 4 this drive massively succeeds. So finally, we can talk there about the IOPS. Now, the IOPS, uh, individual input outputs per second, 
Again, it's an absolute landslide for the 525s there. Just to put that into perspective, this drive here at Gen 3 times 4 has a reported maximum of 240, uh, sorry, 345,000 um, uh, uh, 4K IOPS at read, and at write, just 28,000, which is really low. That actually brings it moderately close to just a small handful of enterprise hard drives. Whereas the 525 here at Gen 4, it's 760,000 over 700,000. And at Gen 3 times 4, it's 640,000 over 565,000. An enormous jump over that on the 510. So all of these statistics so far, what do they actually mean in real terms? Well, when you are utilizing um, a NAS for caching. There's actually different kinds of caching, although there's lots of different ones. I think there's about seven mainstay ones that people utilize. We can focus on the main two, write caching and read caching. Now, read caching, both of these SSDs aren't actually too shabby. Read caching is when you've got the SSDs included in this system, and over time, the system learns what are the files, the configs, the metadata, the, the parts of the arrangement of data in that system that are being the most frequently accessed. Then the system moves clones of that data over to the M2 NVMe cache. Generally, these are much smaller access files in higher density number. Shared drives can sometimes do it. Some NASs like QNAP will allow you to kind of change the IO pattern and the IO algorithm in the background if you want to gear more towards virtualization or databases or multimedia or stuff like that. But ultimately, read caching makes copies of data that's already inside on the hard drives and moves it over to the SSD, and uh, not moves, copies it over to the SSD. So that data, when it is being accessed from the NAS, the NAS will readily hand over the faster accessing data, thereby lowering the latency on that data. Both of these are great for that. Unsurprisingly, it's gonna do a better job on that 525, even on a Gen 4 time, uh, 3 times 4 slot. However, if we move over to write caching, that is where this SSD doesn't just win, it dominates. Write caching, uh, and there again, there are lots of different versions of write caching out there, but you know, the most common method is that when you are sending data to the NAS, the system writes it to the SSD first. It writes the data to the SSD, and then in the background, that data is moved onto the larger area of hard drives. Now, again, during that process, data isn't really kept on the SSD. It is put onto the SSD and then moved over to the hard drive space either shortly afterwards or on a rotational period, there, depending on the write caching method. Now, in write caching, obviously, uh, write performance and high write IOPS are going to be incredibly important. And remember, this absolutely stormed it. In traditional write performance, um, even like block or small data write performance, this absolutely nailed it. Now, that means that when you are utilizing either one of these SSDs inside your NAS system to see the true benefits of caching, you're gonna err towards the 525, which is arriving at a lower price point, a higher architecture, a larger potential bandwidth to upgrade this drive to another system later on, higher performance, higher IOPS. Overall, just a better drive overall. So why on earth would you go for the 510? Does the 510 have no place anymore? Should they just phase it out? Maybe, but it's not the end of the road. Remember that durability that we talked about. If you were utilizing this NAS system for read caching only, it's actually quite a solid bet. Um, for example, that durability being higher means it's going to last longer. Now, read caching doesn't have quite the same rotation of data as write caching, so durability is still less of a factor, but still nonetheless, given uh, the 1GB bottleneck of most mid-range NAS systems, you're not really going to feel all of that difference because you're already pretty much maxing the communication between the hard drives and the SSD managed by the CPU of that NAS anyway. So although you've got that ready performance there, you're probably not going to be able to fill the massive heights of that. It's only when write activity comes into play in a very more, in a pertinent now fashion, not just in a scheduled sort it out later fashion, that the um, 510 can actually stand on its two feet when compared to that 525 SSD. Also bear in mind, 
that with the exception of Synology, the majority of other brands that have got um, M2 NVMe slots inside actually allow you to use them for uh, traditional storage, say storage balls or tiered storage in conjunction with hard drives. Consequently, having the option of having that right performance increase there, it's not to be sniffed at and ultimately, it's why at the end of this video, I'm gonna say that in almost every single way, the Iron Wolf 525 is the better choice between these two SSDs. Yes, it has a slightly lower durability, but bear in mind, the durability of that drive must certainly be linked to that lower throughput anyway. So again, having that durability, it's only gonna last as fast as you can take it. So yes, that has been the main differences between the Seagate Iron Wolf 525 and the 510. I hope you found this video helpful. There is a full guide linked in the description as compares. Hopefully it's live at the same time as this video. If not, give it a day or so. Should be out there for you guys. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, do let me know in the comments or click like. It helps me understand what I do right in these videos and how to make each one better than the last. And don't forget to click like, uh, sorry, subscribe and the bell to be notified about future videos on this subject as we go through a lot more NAS-based NVMe content as more and more brands are hopping on to having server-grade SSDs available. And of course, take advantage of that free advice section over on NAS Compares, genuinely free, um, by two humans, me and Eddie the Web Guy, we answer all of your queries completely for free. There's a donate button, be lovely if you can use it, but you don't have to if you don't want to. I will see you next time.